morning. We're here to give an update on COVID-19 in Oregon, and I'm joined by Patrick Allen, Director of the Oregon Health Authority, Dr. Dean Seidlinger, our state epidemiologist, Dr. Renee Edwards, Chief Medical Officer for Oregon Health Sciences University, and Dr. Bill Messer, Assistant Professor of Infectious Diseases at OHSU School of Medicine. I invited these public health and medical experts here today to give an update on where we stand in our fight against COVID-19 and what lies ahead with the recent discovery of a newly identified mutation of the virus right here in Oregon. But first, I wanted to take a moment to address President Biden's audacious announcement last night that all Americans will be eligible for a vaccine starting on May 1st. We are all hopeful we can safely be reunited with our family and friends for small gatherings by the 4th of July. And as your governor, I will do everything I can to make it happen. Our plan in Oregon has always been to align our vaccination timelines with available federal supplies. As weekly shipment allocations increase, we will reassess those timelines. If the doses are there, I have every intention of utilizing all available state and federal resources to match the president's timeline for universal eligibility. Director Allen will address Oregon's capacity for vaccine distribution in more detail. But let me be very, very clear. While our timelines will accelerate with available supplies, my commitment to equity in our vaccine distribution will not change. We will continue to prioritize our most vulnerable Oregonians, including seniors, people with underlying health conditions, and our frontline workers so that they can be at the front of the line. It's truly remarkable to think about what is possible today when we remember where we were on this day one year ago. Today marks one year since I extended the spring break period for Oregon schools just days before we shut them down completely. I remember the great uncertainty we faced with this virus at that time. One year later, we've certainly learned a lot. We know how to safely create low risk environments in schools and the necessary public health measures to reduce transmission. And just this morning, I signed the executive order to reopen Oregon schools for in-person instruction. I'm happy to report as of this week, there are now more than 174,000 students back in the classroom. And we're excited that all of our kids will have the opportunity to return in the coming weeks. I'm also thrilled that following the return to in-person instruction this spring, we'll be able to bring back the summer enrichment programs that spark joy and foster creativity for our children. And we'll do so more equitably than in years past, ensuring that families from historically underserved communities have access to summer programs and making sure the programs offered are culturally relevant. The $250 million package I announced with Speaker Kotek and President Courtney earlier this week significantly expands summer learning and childcare opportunities for our families that have been hit hard by the impacts of COVID-19. After the hardship Oregon's kids have endured throughout the pandemic, it's a step forward to offer this time and space to encourage healing, additional learning, and have a little fun this summer. This investment will be complemented by the resources from the 1.9 million, sorry, trillion American Rescue Plan that Congress passed and the president signed yesterday. I'm incredibly grateful to the Oregon congressional delegation for all of their work to get this package over the finish line. It will provide much needed relief to Oregon families, help small businesses get back on their feet, 
allow renters and homeowners to stay in their homes and accelerate our timelines to crush this virus. We're also making progress on the vaccine front. We're now 47% through Oregonians who are over 65 and over half of seniors over the age of 75, in addition to being largely complete with our educator workforce. With three safe and effective vaccines now available and more supplies coming in from the federal government, we are getting an average of 24,000 shots in the arms of Oregonians each day. That's truly amazing. And I'm so encouraged to see so many Oregonians who are eager to get the vaccine when it's available to them. Along the way, Oregon continues to shine in how our communities are coming together to beat this pandemic. For example, in Malheur County, the Klamath Health Network and Valley Family Healthcare have transformed a used ambulance into a mobile unit to reach remote Oregonians for both testing and vaccinations. Mosaic Medical, serving Central Oregon, is using the remaining vaccine doses allocated to their staff to go on site and immunize Oregonians at the region's largest shelter for unhoused people. One Community Health has been literally going door to door to share information, arrange transportation to vaccine sites, and coordinate social services for tribal communities along the Columbia River. This is incredibly creative work, and I'm so proud of the work our communities are doing and going the extra mile to help one another out. We must also continue to make smart choices around the public health measures we know work. Be because while we know vaccine supplies are ramping up, enabling us to reach more of you more quickly, we are most definitely not out of the woods just yet. I wanted to close by talking about a significant challenge on the horizon, the discovery of a new COVID-19 mutation believed to have occurred spontaneously here in Oregon. This is the latest sign that this virus is capable of evolving. It's certainly alarming and an important reminder that even in this semi-vaccinated chapter of the pandemic we find ourselves in, where grandparents may be safer, kids are going back to school, and we're all feeling a bit more hopeful, we must still keep our guard up. Let's use this moment to keep making smart choices and venture slowly out onto the ice. We have come so far with counties across the state entering list lower risk levels and reopening businesses and schools. We don't want this to be a moment where the ice cracks below us. So keep wearing your mask, continue to physically distance, no large gatherings just yet, and get the vaccine, any one of the three, when it's made available to you. We just need to hold on a little bit longer. And with that, I will turn it over to Director Allen to give a vaccine update, and then over to the doctors to share more on the mutation and what it means for all of us. Over to you, Director Allen. Thank you, Governor Brown. Uh, again, I'm Patrick Allen, Director of the Oregon Health Authority. And today I'm joined by Dr. Dean Seidlinger, our state health officer. This morning, I'll update you on vaccinations in Oregon and tell you about a new group of people who will now be eligible to get vaccinated on March 29th. And Dr. Seidlinger will share the findings from our latest COVID-19 model and what the forecast looks like in coming weeks as we continue to ramp up vaccinations and monitor the spread of new COVID-19 variants. But first, I wanna echo Governor Brown's comments about President Biden's speech last night and his direction to states to open vaccine eligibility to all adults by May 1st. We appreciate the administration's commitment to delivering enough vaccine to meet the president's goal. Oregon is ready. Oregon's vaccinators have the capacity to double our current average number of doses administ administered per day, which is about 24,000 today. Oregon is on track with our current eligibility timelines, which we set based on our current allocations. We've been clear we want to advance our timelines and we can move them up if we receive enough doses from the federal government. <clears throat> However, 
we need to know when more vaccine vials will actually arrive in Oregon as promised before we can tell a for frontline worker or anyone else that we're adjusting our timelines. We know the previous administration made major announcements that they weren't able to fulfill. While this administration has met its commitments so far, we don't have any specific information about when any additional doses will arrive. Until we get more clarity, we need to keep our current timelines in place. We can't disappoint people who eagerly want a vaccine. We need to see the increased doses in the federal ordering system. Right now, no one in the federal government has given us hard numbers on what we can expect and when. We don't yet have more doses we can order. So let's look at where we stand right now. Let's go to the uh, slides, please. Based on today's numbers, Oregon vaccinators have administered 1,269,595 first and second doses. Over the past seven days ending yesterday, Oregon vaccinators reported administering an average of 24,151 doses per day. More than 800,000 Oregonians have received at least their first dose. Oregon has administered first doses to 19% of our population, or almost one in every five Oregonians. The national average is 19%. Oregon has complete one or two dose vaccination series for 454,321 people. Overall, 11% of Oregonians have been fully vaccinated. We remain ahead of the national average for fully vaccinated people. The national average is 9.9%. Based on these numbers, Oregon remains on track with our vaccination timelines. Let's start with older adults and go to the next slide, please. As of Wednesday, Oregon had vaccinated 356,830 adults over 65. That's 47% of seniors. As this slide shows, we've vaccinated six in 10 Oregonians who are 80 or older and more than half of people 75 and older. By the end of March, we expect we will have vaccinated eight in 10 seniors before we open eligibility to the next groups, including people with underlying conditions. We do see variations in senior vaccination rates across counties. At present, more than 80% of 75 year olds and above have been vaccinated in Deschutes County, for example. However, other counties are lagging. This week, we're providing one-time catch-up catch doses for seven counties. The extra dose amounts will go to Clatsop County, 700 doses, Columbia County, 1,100 doses, Coos County, 1,400 doses, Curry and Grant counties, 500 doses each, Jackson County, 2,040 doses, and Josephine County, 3,080 doses. In addition, as the governor mentioned, Oregon has essentially finished vaccinating educators. According to a survey data gathered by the Oregon Department of Education, 87% of school districts reported that 100% of their staff had been given an opportunity to get immunized against COVID-19. And another 5% said that 90% of their staff had been offered a vaccination. Will there be a teacher or childcare worker who hasn't been given an opportunity to get vaccinated? Yes, but those cases should be the exception. Now let's look at our allocations going forward. Let's go to slide three, please. Currently, Oregon is receiving 126,530 first doses per week from the federal government. That allocation includes 56,160 doses of the Pfizer vaccine and 40,800 doses of the Moderna vaccine. There is no news on when consistent allocations of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will begin, though we did receive notice we are receiving 4,800 doses for shipment next week. The federal government is also shipping 31,470 doses uh, directly to retail pharmacies and 4,000 doses to federally qualified health centers. Based on what we project prior, uh, projected prior to the president's speech last night, by the end of March, we expect our weekly supply of first doses to increase to more than 200,000 doses per week. Our currently projected allocations put our Oregon on track to administer first doses to more than a million people by March 29th or about 77% of all currently eligible people, from healthcare workers to first responders, to nursing home residents, teachers, childcare workers, and all eligible seniors. As a result, on March 29th, we will open vaccinations to people 45 and older who have underlying health conditions, along with migrant and seasonal farm workers, wildland firefighters, seafood and agricultural workers, and other groups. I also wanna announce one eligibility change. All pregnant women, 16 and older, will become vaccine eligible starting March 29th. Since most women who are pregnant are younger than 45, we wanted to make sure every pregnant woman who had the, had the opportunity to get vaccinated 
when we open eligibility to people with underlying conditions. This week, we'll also expand our pilot program that enables federally qualified health centers to vaccinate all of their patients 16 or older. Let's go to slide four, please. Starting the week of March 15th, we'll increase our dose allocations to FQHCs by 4,500 doses and add four new centers, Mosaic Medical and uh, Mosaic Medical's Mattress Clinic, Northwest Human Services in Polk County, Klamath Health Partnership, and CHC of Benton and Lynn Counties to the program. The FQHC pilot is one way we're addressing the disparate impact of the pandemic and current disparities in vaccination rates. For example, Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic sites in Marion and Umatilla counties serve a population that is over 95% Latino and Latina in communities that have seen some of the highest coronavirus transmission rates in the state. FQHC allocations help us target vaccinations for Oregonians that have been hardest hit by COVID-19. As this slide shows, on February 19th, the Oregon FQHC average test positivity rate was 12%. The highest FQHC test positivity rate was 19% statewide in December. Currently, Oregon distributes 3,700 doses per week to seven FQHCs, operating at 20 different sites. This allocation is in addition to the 4,000 doses per week that specific FQHCs receive through the federal program. By the end of this week, FQHCs will have received a total of 21,000 doses through the state and federal allocation programs. This pilot FQHC expanded eligibility program is vitally important because FQHCs serve as a trusted source of care in the community, especially for migrant and seasonal farm workers, other agricultural workers, and food processing workers. While the pilot sites can offer vaccines without restrictions, we have asked our FQHC partners to focus on older adults during March. FQHCs also offer flexible and innovative ways to distribute vaccines to people who may have uh, mobility limitations, transportation barriers, or who are otherwise unable to get to a mass vaccination clinic to get a shot. At least nine centers report willingness to provide large throughput vaccination efforts offsite. Seven centers uh, can provide mobile clinic services and two centers have plans for home visits. And you heard several stories that the governor shared about specific uh, activities at different FQHCs around the state. Now here's a brief update on our collaboration with the All for Oregon partnership that's operating the mass vaccination clinic at the Oregon Convention Center. Starting with a pilot last week, We've implemented a new system to make it faster and easier for seniors in the Portland metro area to schedule an appointment at the Oregon Convention Center. OHA pulls a list from people in the Portland metro area who've registered using the Get Vaccinated Oregon tool. We then send an email or text to those individuals to alert them that they will be receiving an email from all for oregon with an invitation to book their appointment at the Convention Center. As a result, seniors don't have to compete to get an appointment by logging onto a website at a certain day or time. Instead, seniors will receive an email with a personalized link that lets them schedule a date and time convenient for them. Early indications tell us the new system is working well. This week, All for Oregon scheduled appointments for more than 16,000 seniors to be scheduled this week at the Oregon Convention Center. To date, All for Oregon has delivered more than 160,000 vaccinations at the OCC since opening on January 25th. This new system is easily scalable. As vaccine supply increases, as we expect we'll see in the weeks ahead, it can easily accommodate larger numbers of people who've registered. If you want a vaccine appointment or information about vaccination efforts in your area, go to the Get Vaccinated Oregon tool and register. Seniors in the Portland metro area, if you signed up on GVO, please check your email inbox daily for the email invitation from all for Oregon. Be sure to look in all your mailboxes, not just your primary inbox. If you no longer need a vaccine or vaccine information, please delete your GVO account. Finally, I want to end on one important point, which is related to the information Dr. Seidlinger and Dr. Edwards will provide on variants. I want to underscore that Johnson & Johnson was 100% effective in preventing COVID-19 deaths during clinical trials, which were conducted in parts of the world where new variants were already circulating. This past week, Oregon received 34,000 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and will receive 4,800 more next week. To date, vaccinators have administered 5,687 doses of Johnson & Johnson. We know some counties are using the more flexible one-dose vaccine to vaccinate harder to reach seniors and other groups of people, which affects their speed in rolling out this vaccine. 
We also know people have asked questions about how the one dose Johnson and Johnson vaccine compares to the other two dose vaccines. It's important for Oregonians to understand that all our vaccines are the safest and most effective way to stop the spread of the virus. The best COVID-19 vaccine is the one you can get. Different vaccines were measured through clinical trials conducted at different times in different places, measuring different outcomes. All our vaccines are proved to be safe and reduce your risks from COVID-19. Oregon is deploying the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in all settings to provide people and communities in all parts of the state. We're allocating Johnson & Johnson to mass vaccination clinics in the Portland metro region, to local public health agencies, to pharmacies, and to other vaccination sites and providers all across Oregon. We see Johnson & Johnson as one of our most effective and flexible vaccines. I appreciate Governor Brown getting it immunized with the one-shot vaccine last weekend. When it's my turn to get a vaccine, I'll be happy to get whatever vaccine is available. Now, let me turn it over to Dr. Seidlinger to talk about our latest COVID-19 forecast and what OHA is doing to monitor the emergence of variants. Dr. Seidlinger. Thank you, Director Allen. Before I discuss the most recent COVID-19 forecast, I'd like to briefly summarize the status of the pandemic in Oregon. We continue to see a general trend of declining daily COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and the percent of positive tests as vaccines become more available to Oregonians and as risk levels subside for counties across the state. This is a result of the continued work all Oregonians are taking to protect themselves and their families. So thank you. Just 10 weeks ago, as 2021 dawned, our seven-day rolling average of daily new cases was 1,149. As of yesterday, the seven-day rolling average was 295, a 74% decline. In our most recent weekly report for the week of March 1st through the 7th, OHA reported 1,729 cases, a 35% decrease from the previous week. To date, there have been 159,037 reported cases of COVID-19 in Oregon. COVID-19 hospitalizations are also trending dramatically lower. On January 2nd, OHA reported 466 virus-stricken patients in our hospital. Yesterday, there were 121, or 74% decline. And last week, we reported the lowest weekly total of COVID-19 patients in five months. The percentage of positive tests has also dropped to 2.8%, which is the lowest since our test since our change to a test-based um, testing method in mid-November. COVID-19 associated deaths have also fallen from their peaks in December. To date, there have been 2,319 COVID-19 related deaths in Oregon. Every death represents the loss of a loved one, a neighbor, a friend, or a colleague. My thoughts go out to everyone who has experienced the loss due to COVID-19. Just a month ago, 27 of Oregon's 36 counties were classified as extreme or high risk from spread of COVID-19. Today, there are 11. Today, only two are considered as extreme risk and 25 counties are at moderate or lower risk. And more good news, the CDC has issued guidelines around interactions for fully vaccinated people, allowing small gatherings in private places. All of this is really encouraging news, and it's a testament to our collective efforts to control the spread of the virus. And I say, I say thank you, Oregonians. But as it seems, with all things COVID, progress is conditional. The virus is dangerous, and it remains a threat to all of us. Recently, we identified a case of the P1 variant, a more contagious variant of the COVID-19 virus originating in Brazil. This was in a resident in Douglas County who traveled um, to that region. This past weekend, it was reported that a mutation of the B117, more prominently known as the UK variant, had been discovered in Oregon. These appear to be isolated cases, but they can spread very quickly as we've seen in other countries. To address this concern, we will rely on our public health response for case investigation and contact tracing, as well as all Oregonians continue to take the steps to protect themselves and their families, wearing masks, keeping physical distancing, limiting indoor gatherings, and getting a vaccine when it's available to you. Variants and mutations to a virus are not unusual. We are watching these warily, but we believe that any of the existing vaccines, including the Johnson & Johnson single-dose vaccine, are effective at present, preventing severe consequences from these diseases, like hospitalizations and death. 
but the presence of these variants and the effect of the lowering of risk levels in our counties presents new risks, especially with the inviting spring and summer weather seem to be arriving. As you've heard, more than 800,000 Oregonians have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine, and more than 1.2 million doses have been administered so far. More people are being vaccinated every day, and every Oregonian that gets vaccinated brings us closer to ending this pandemic. But getting vaccination is not a free pass to come to our pre-pandemic behavior, and we are months away from achieving our community immunity. Our recent modeling suggests that with the presence of the new variants and the relaxing of restrictions, we can expect to see an increase in new cases. Or put more bluntly, we can expect to see wider distribution of this virus in Oregon. But we can slow that momentum by continuing to take the steps that have been proven to slow this virus. We can protect our loved ones by wearing our masks, keeping our distance, um, limiting our indoor gatherings, and getting vaccinated when it's our turn. So let me turn for a moment to the newest COVID-19 forecast. We estimate that transmission rate of the virus declined slightly from February, early February through February 24th, with an estimated reproductive number of 0.83. If that level of transmission holds, we can expect further declines in daily cases to an estimated daily average of just 170 cases a day and six new daily hospitalizations between March 17th and 30th. However, if the more contagious variants take hold or if we relax our vigilance and transmission increases by 30%, we'd see a reproductive number of 1.1 and daily cases would be at 265 with 10 more daily hospitalizations. But we must remain vigilant and experience has shown us that small setbacks can have huge consequences. Throughout, or, um, throughout Oregon, students are returning to their classrooms in greater numbers. In-person instruction is important for the well-being and mental health of our students. OHA and the Oregon Department of Education are working to refine public health and safety protocols to allow for a return to learning with lower risk. We can't lapse in our resolve um, to re reverse the progress that we're making. I want to conclude by acknowledging the stress and anxiety this pandemic has caused all Oregonians. The emotional strain from not seeing our loved ones the financial toll of lost businesses and lost income, the pressures from turning our lives inside out to mitigate the impact of the virus. I realize that even good news of a return to in-person instruction is a significant change in our lives that can create anxiety for students and their families. My thoughts go out to everyone who's suffering from the stress brought upon by the impacts of COVID-19. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health symptoms, please know that help is available. The Safe and Strong website is designed to support people who are facing challenges related to COVID-19 or other life stressors. Go to safestrongoregon.org or call 1-800-923-HELP or 4357. If you or someone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis, please know that help is available. You can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline 24-7 at 800 273 8255, or for Spanish, 888-628-9454. Oregonians care about others and care about their communities. And by continuing to work together, we can save lives and rid our communities of COVID-19. And with that, I'll turn things over um, to Dr. Renee Edwards. Thank you and good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Renee Edwards and I serve as the Chief Medical Officer for OHSU Health. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you again today. I'm encouraged by the projections that Dr. Seidlinger has just shared with us about COVID-19 in Oregon. And I'm truly proud of the efforts that we all have made to help slow the spread of this virus in our state. It's been a difficult year for all of us, but your hard work is paying off. Because of your efforts, Oregon has the fourth lowest total number of deaths per capita, and we've maintained great performance against this virus over the last nine weeks. On behalf of my healthcare and public health colleagues, thank you. But it's actually because of this amazing success that I'm here today to ask everyone to remain vigilant in our collective work against COVID-19 and to continue to practice physical distancing, hand hygiene, 
and mask wearing, whether or not you've been vaccinated against COVID-19. As we heard, Oregon's vaccination rates continue to increase. This is exciting to hear, but we still have a ways to go before we have adequate vaccination rates across the entire state. We aren't out of the woods just yet. From the beginning, we've said that tackling this pandemic would be a marathon, and we're in the last stretches, but not yet across the finish line. This is especially true as new and potentially more contagious virus variants continue to emerge and spread across our communities. Earlier this month, two concerning variants, those prevalent in Brazil and California, were found from COVID-19 test samples taken in Douglas and Lane counties. And just this week, we learned that researchers at the Oregon SARS-CoV-2 Genome Sequencing Center at OHSU have detected a novel virus variant, never before detected in the United States, but now right here in our own backyard. This variant contains characteristics of both the B117 strain that first found in the United Kingdom and a newer virus mutation known as E484K or EEK that is currently circulating in both Brazil and South Africa. I'm pleased that my colleague, Dr. Bill Messer, a co-investigator at the center, will join us a bit later to answer your questions about this new finding. So what does all of this mean? I want to acknowledge that there's still a lot to learn about how these new variants may impact Oregonians. We certainly don't have all the answers yet. More investigation is necessary to better understand how prevalent they are in Oregon if they may increase severity of illness or whether they may still infect a vaccinated person. However, B117 has been shown to be a highly contagious variant and E484K is thought to be a key mutation in other variants of concern, which is why we must remain vigilant as we do not want these variants to take hold in Oregon. We do know that viruses like SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, constantly change. It's a common part of a virus's life cycle, which is why we're hearing of so many variants. This also means that we'll continue to see new mutations and variants emerge throughout the remaining course of the pandemic. But I want to reassure you that not all virus mutations are troublesome. While some may become more persistent or contagious, others may not affect disease severity at all or how fast they spread, so you may not even hear of them. But this is why it's important that we use sophisticated scientific processes and technologies to identify monitor and report any signs of new virus variants that may result in Oregon or across the globe. Understanding how the virus is evolving will aid in information to you, to our public health response, and to our vaccination efforts. Some good news to share, we are encouraged that currently available COVID-19 vaccines do appear to be effective in preventing severe illness and death in these virus variants of concern, including those currently present here in Oregon, which is all the more reason why we must push ahead in our vaccination efforts. However, we must remember that vaccines are just one part of our toolkit. Remember, we are not across the finish line yet, and we do not want to lose this race by relaxing at the end. Incredibly, one year ago, almost to the day, I and others asked you to do your part to flatten the curve against COVID-19 in Oregon. And you have done just that. It's imperative that we continue our collective interventions of physical distancing, mask wearing, hand washing, and limiting social gatherings, all of which remain in alignment with CDC guidelines. Through your efforts and sacrifice, these measures have all proven effective and remain effective and vital as these variants emerge in helping to limit illness and slow the spread of COVID-19 
as we cross the finish line. Thank you. Dr. Edwards, we really appreciate you joining us from OHSU. With that, Charles, I think we're ready for questions. Thank you, Governor. 